I'm Luke Wiley, an undergraduate student at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga, and this is Change and Chat, Conversations About Our Democracy. Chattanooga, Tennessee in 2023. It is in many ways an unremarkable American city in that its problems and processes, makeup and machinations are not wholly unique. In many ways, its problems are emblematic of the American South writ large. Of course, it can oftentimes be too easy to pin a place's problem solely on its location in the South. It obscures and obfuscates the histories of other American cities and other American regions. It is easy and tempting for someone in a comfortable liberal city and online echo chamber to denounce an entire southern state for the decisions of its lawmakers, who often choose their voters instead of the voters choosing them, through gerrymandered redistricting. When the unprecedented snowstorms ravaged Texas in 2021, there were voices on Twitter who admitted to deriving a sick and twisted pleasure from the immense pain and loss of life because the state had just recently voted for both Greg Abbott and Donald Trump. A tweet with over 19,000 likes says, quote, Raise your hand if you're in a blue state. It's really cold and your lights and heat are still on. A tweet from author Stephen King similarly says, Hey Texas, keep voting for officials who don't believe in climate change and supported privatization of the power grid. End quote. To these users from more liberal states, the individual people who both live and make a community in red states, whether or not they themselves voted for Republican politicians, deserve pain, suffering, and even to lose their lives. The point of this podcast episode is to shed light on the myriad and pressing issues facing Chattanooga and in some ways Tennessee at large. Many of these issues are the result of right-wing attempts to privatize public infrastructure and spaces, to cut funding for programs, and to remove the state entirely from helping its citizens. But the real overarching point of this podcast is also to show its humanity the stubborn yet beautiful resolve that people can have toward their neighbors. This is about not only when the state seemingly gives up on caring for the widow and the orphan, the disabled and the unemployed, the poor and the oppressed. It is about when the people themselves choose, in a radical act, to step in and do the work of the state themselves, to feed their neighbors and to build public infrastructure and accommodations. If neoliberalism is the death of all things public, then community-based mutual aid projects may be the chance to rebuild a conception of the public good in a new way. Chattanooga, not Boston or Berkeley or New York, can help show the country a way forward and maybe a way out. You can't tell the story of modern-day America or Tennessee or Chattanooga without neoliberalism. Neoliberalism is a big word that can tend to be thrown around without a deep analysis of what it really, truly means. It stems from the Austrian School of Economics and the Chicago School of Economics, people like Hayek and Milton Friedman, who sought to overturn the post-war policies of Keynesian economics and the creation of generous welfare states across the globe. At the core is the privatization of public goods and services, replacing them with financial market-based entities. It is the encroachment of private equity and capital markets into the realm of the state. For instance, the Republican attempts to either wholly privatize Social Security and Medicare or to at least slowly add private components to it, like private Medicare Advantage plans. This is all under the misguided and dangerous assumption that private corporations are somehow more efficient and can do a better job of administering these services than a supposedly bloated and sclerotic government of career bureaucrats. When the government is accused of failing, or in times of manufactured economic crisis, neoliberal politicians also rely on austerity measures, essentially cutting funding for any remaining public institutions, especially schools and libraries. Neoliberalism is not only limited to these physical actions. Instead, political theorist and philosopher Wendy Brown argues that the stealth revolution of neoliberalism is that it also seeks to extend the logic of financialization and markets, into every other aspect of our lives. We are taught to perform cost-benefit analyses for small, non-financial decisions. We use terms like investment to describe the time it may take to watch a new television show. And goals of productivity pervade our every thought and induce guilt or shame in moments of relaxation. 
We are all competitors, not neighbors or fellow workers. Even the divide between labor and capital has been replaced by one new single category, human capital. Human beings themselves have been reduced to capital. And Tennessee has been the perfect pupil in this school of neoliberal thought. There is no state income tax in Tennessee, only a sales tax, which is one of the highest in the nation. Instead of a progressive income tax that taxes those who make more money and less for those who make less money, the Republican elected officials in Tennessee have instead prioritized a regressive tax that punishes poor and working people. And unlike in some states, necessities like food and groceries still have sales tax. And under the Affordable Care Act, states can receive federal funding to expand Medicaid within the state, essentially free money from the federal government. And yet, Tennessee is one of only 11 states to refuse this money. Former governor and businessman Bill Haslam repeatedly enjoined the legislature to accept the money to expand TennCare, but the legislature repeatedly rebuffed him. In order to make an ideological stand against the federal government, right-wing elected officials have chosen to allow their poor neighbors to continue to struggle and even die from lack of access to health care. Similarly, the Tennessee Department of Health, under the Bill Lee administration, has recently rejected federal money from the CDC that went toward programs to prevent HIV, like free condoms, testing, and PrEP. Again, this was free money given directly to the state, without any financial burden on the state. And again, a harmful and misguided but principled stand against the mere existence of a federal government and the desire to cut public funding whenever possible comes at the expense of the lives of poor and working people. According to data from the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis's FRED database, 13.7% of Tennesseans lived below the poverty line in 2021. In Hamilton County, where Chattanooga is located, the rate was a little lower at 12.7%, essentially the same as the national average of 12.8%. With large corporations like Unum, TBA, EPB, Blue Cross Blue Shield, and others investing heavily in the area, Chattanooga has become known as Gig City. Filled with new and exciting restaurants, coffee shops, and bars for a tech industry-related millennials to enjoy. But like so many things in the United States, there are often hidden nuances and conditions that erase inequalities. The experience of Chattanooga for white Chattanoogans is different from the experience of black Chattanoogans. In a report, the Urban League of Greater Chattanooga found glaring and vicious inequalities. In 2019, the median white Chattanooga family had an income of $77,321, while the median black family made only $37,069, only 60% of the median white family's income. Disparities also extend into health-related outcomes, with higher rates of diseases like diabetes, renal disease, and cancer, as well as subsequent mortality rates. There are also individual and systemic disparities for Chattanoogans who are members of the LGBTQ community immigrants, and the disabled. In light of all these statistics, it is important to ask system-based questions. What does a state owe its citizens? What is to be done when the state abnegates its responsibilities as a state towards its citizens? What happens when a state actively legislates and advocates against its own people? Do we all give up and accept that the state no longer has any interest whatsoever in making our lives better in any way? Do we then turn against the idea of government, or do we strive to make it better? Can that be done from the inside, or must it be accomplished by agitating outside of it? These are the questions facing millions of people in states across the country that have enacted similar neoliberal programs and regressive social policies. The two local Chattanooga mutual aid organizations that I will cover in this episode have some answers. First is the Chattanooga Urbanist Society, a mutual aid organization made up of anonymous members of the community who are passionate about equitable urban design and planning. With the recent rise in public interest into walkable and bikeable cities and proposals to create nationwide high-speed passenger rail, as well as reinvesting in city public transportation, the Chattanooga Urbanist Society in November of 2022 felt that it was time to act. As one of the primary members told me via email correspondence, Quote, we had enough and decided we needed to just take action. End quote. That decision to take direct action lies at the heart of what makes mutual aid so powerful. 
when the mayor of Chattanooga decided to remove all public benches in the downtown area in order to prevent the city's homeless population from having a place to sleep, the Chattanooga Urbanist Society decided to go against this repressive act of the state by simply replacing the benches. Instead of the city provided metal benches, now in their place were wooden benches made of old reclaimed wood, painted and placed by average anonymous citizens who cared about the well-being of their homeless neighbors. Embarrassed by the widespread local support for this guerrilla act of so-called tactical urbanism, the mayor's office reacted by quickly replacing all of the city's benches. The direct action worked. A simple act of defiance by a handful of citizens defeated the neoliberal local government's acquiescence to spurious right-wing arguments about homelessness and crime. Central to the ideas of Jane Jacobs, a hero to proponents of new urbanism, is the idea that a city is more than the buildings that make it up. Rather, a city is a living, breathing thing filled with thousands or even millions of people. And central to that is the presence of public spaces, spaces in which people of all backgrounds and lives interact and mingle. However, again, if neoliberalism represents the death of anything public, then that must importantly include public spaces, like parks and downtowns. After their win against the city government, the Chattanooga Urbanist Society decided to make more benches for other parts of the city that have long been neglected by the government, sites of public transportation. Only a few bus stops in the greater Chattanooga area had benches for people to use while waiting for their bus. Even fewer have any sort of shelter around the bus stop. Now, members of the Urbanist Society have made a total of 30 benches and have already placed 12 at bus stops around the county. In order to engage with other Chattanoogans, they have also encouraged local artists to paint the benches, adding personality and flair to the simple yet sturdy wooden benches. And these actions are popular. The organization has over 3,000 followers on Instagram and over 101,000 followers on TikTok. Because they have acted in reaction to the city government's policies, and knowing the historical linkage of mutual aid and the political thought of anarchism, I was curious as to their conception of the state and its responsibilities. When asked about the role of the state in all of this, they responded, quote, Look, what we don't realize is that the majority of help ever offered to a human is not by the state. Whether it's the state's job or not, we help those we're closest to. We don't think the state shouldn't exist, but in a perfect world, they wouldn't have to exist. But we forget the state's job is to support the people, because the people are the heart of the community. And right now, we have a society that is so isolated and individualistic, I'm not sure there's enough funding in the world to create a state that could bridge the gap. All we have is each other, and mutual aid is a recognition of that. But we also firmly believe that the more we come together and help each other, the more likely we are to get a government that's supportive and does its job. End quote. What's next for the Chattanooga Urbanist Society? A member of the organization wrote that, quote, by the end of the year, if we aren't seeing significant strides in public safety, we plan on getting more bold in our measures, like painting crosswalks where they belong, setting up planters to separate cyclist lanes from car lanes, end quote. This will undoubtedly represent an escalation in guerrilla tactics, but based on the level of local interest and support, the city government will be forced to respond by either listening to their constituents or continuing to neglect our public infrastructure that working-class Chattanoogans depend on every single day. The mutual aid being performed by the Chattanooga Urbanist Society did not begin in a vacuum. Rather, the initial members, who had exhausted other means of democratic engagement through town halls and city council meetings, looked to other existing local mutual aid organizations. One of them was the Chattanooga Free Store, a store that is exactly and profoundly what it sounds like. It is a profoundly simple idea that people who need clothing and necessities can get them, and for free. The free store offers multiple racks of clothing, a section of household items, a community library, and a public restroom. Importantly, the free store also offers free menstrual products, contraception and emergency contraception, and pregnancy tests, as well as naloxone and fentanyl testing strips. Inspired by a similar mutual aid organization in Birmingham, Alabama, Avery Fairburn and their partner, Lauren Lilith, started the free store in June of 2021. Through email correspondence, Fairburn described the basic idea as, quote, 
a community space where folks get what they need and help out how they can, without any conditions or policing or religious aspect. The store is open every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday from 6 to 8 p.m., which usually sees about 20 people each night. The store is also open every fourth Saturday of the month, during which they offer essentials like diapers, household cleaners, and hygiene products, which typically sees about 70 to 80 families. Like with the Chattanooga Urbanist Society, I was curious to hear how these mutual aid organizers view the state and our relations to it. Avery responded saying that, quote, Voting is important, but most of the time, it's not going to materially change the condition of people, especially not in a deep red state like Tennessee. Electoral politics moves slowly and stalls often, and in the meantime, your neighbors are hungry. I see mutual aid as folks working together to meet the community's needs without waiting around for the permission of elected leaders who don't face the same circumstances. End quote. While the Chattanooga Free Store has not had the same relationship to local government as the Urbanist Society has, for instance, the Free Store has received support from nearby Red Bank Mayor Holly Berry and Vice Mayor Stephanie Dalton. Both organizers evinced a similar understanding of the people's relation to the state. Essential to mutual aid is Avery's assertion of the immediate necessity of materially helping our fellow citizens and neighbors, while the purposefully slow years of government turn. In between election cycles, people still need clothes and food, diapers and medicine, wages and rent. And one additional note that Avery wished to make was that Avery and Lauren are trans, and the free store was, quote, intended as a safe place for queer people from the beginning. Considering how scary it is in Tennessee right now, we want other trans folk to know that the free store is here, whether you need clothes, reproductive health items, or just a caring community, end quote a necessary and vital message in these dark times of broader Tennessee politics. For members of the Chattanooga community who are listening to this episode and have interest in helping or volunteering at the Free Store, you can go to www.chattfreestore.org slash volunteer, which will also be in the show notes. For others who may be listening from elsewhere, you can still donate by going to their website which is, again, www.chattfreestore.org. Links for the Chattanooga Urban Society will also be available in the show notes. I will end the episode with this. Jedediah Purdy, a professor of law at Duke University, writes that democracy's, quote, ambition is to overcome the half-random hierarchies and divisions we are born into and move toward a world that we can see ourselves as building together. Democracy aims at building a life in which we are less fundamentally strangers, less one another's problems and threats, and more nearly collaborators, even when we disagree. These two organizations, amongst others, are doing just that. They are attempting to build a new world together. There's an old leftist saying that a new world is possible. Even if it may be difficult sometimes to envision that new world, it is possible. And it must be built from the ground up by the people themselves. And the Chattanooga Urbanist Society and the Chattanooga Free Store are doing just that. Not as individuals, but as members of a broader community. As a representative from the Chattanooga Urbanist Society said, ending their interview, quote, In the end, all we have is each other. And each other is going to be enough. Again, this was Luke Wiley, an undergraduate student at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga, and this is Change and Chat, Conversations About Our Democracy.